Sorry. Let me just add that I think what I'm telling you today is probably more different from anything else in your series than <laughs> anything else in your series is from any other other thing in your series. It's really, re, I'm really saying that the Western perspective on the mind is totally inadequate and, it's, and, and we need a major course correction. So this is a very extreme view, but I, but I, I think that there are a lot of persuasive reasons uh, to take it seriously. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where we are very pleased to welcome Professor Michael Sloth. He is UST Professor of Ethics at the University of Miami, and his research focuses primarily on ethics and mind, especially on virtues, sentimentalism, um, as well as now some more Eastern philosophy and related topics. Um, his books include From Morality to Virtue, The Ethics and Care of Empathy, um, moral sentimentalism, uh, as well as a few others. Um, he ha has a variety of published articles, one of which will be our, the focus of our discussion today. But uh, feel free to add anything. But with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Sloth. Well, very glad to be with you. Awesome. So the article we're uh, going to discuss is called the Yin Yang of Pervasive Emotion, uh, which will be a chapter in the forthcoming volume called uh, Knowers and Knowledge in East-West Philosophy, Epistemology Extended. So as a sort of broad outline in this paper, you look to employ a somewhat updated notion of uh, Yin and Yang to cognition and agency, and you consider Yin more as passivity and Yang as like purposiveness and directed. Well, no, purpose. no, uh, let me correct you. Yeah. you. We can't understand Yin as passivity because then it's totally uh, in, in, incompatible with activity. And so I understand Yin as receptivity. Sorry, receptivity, yes. Yeah. <laughs> receptivity has an active element to it. We welcome certain things when we are receptive. Welcoming is a, you know, is an activity or is a purpose. Is it? That passivity has none of that. Right, that's a good point. I, I, I think I had meant to, I had meant to write that down, but um, somehow had had written it as 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 passivity. Um, yeah. Uh, um, but more on that, like, uh, can you explain more on the notion you have in mind and and why you think it should be updated in the in the way you you do? Oh, sure, sure. You know, traditionally, uh, there were two ways of understanding yin and yang. One was the majority tradition, I would say, and it involved uh, thinking of, of, of yin and yang uh, as, in effect, forces in nature. Uh, yin was, was dark and wet. Uh, yang was bright and dry. Uh, yin was cold and yang was warm. And uh, these factors were used to explain natural phenomena. Uh, and given what they knew at the time, uh, it made sense for the Chinese to do that. But we, we now know that natural phenomena are not explained the way uh, this yin-yang explanation would go. For example, they, they said that the reason why uh, night is followed by day is that the brightness of day pushes out the darkness of night. Okay, that kind of explanation just won't do in modern circumstances. They didn't know any better than that. They had a kind of cyclical universe and they thought that a yin-yang cycle would be the best explanation, but we have to reject that. Uh, also, there's a lot of sexism involved in the, uh, the yin and yang as understood the way uh, they understood it. All the bad qualities were associated with women and all the good qualities with men. You know, men were warm, women were cold. Men, men were bright, women were dark. So, you know, there's a lot of reason to, to get rid of this majority conception of yin and yang. And then there's this other conception, 
which is a minority view, but it was there always, all along, even from the I Ching uh, of yin uh, and yang, not as opposites like dark and light, but as necessary complements, uh, friendly to each other, okay, rather than pushing each other out, accommodating each other simultaneously and in a kind of necessary uh, mode of, 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 of accommodation. So uh, this, this notion, I think, can be of, of use to us in understanding the human mind in a way, in, and in modern, in, in modern terms, uh, uh, in a way that the, this older uh, notion just isn't useful at all. And so what I've, what I've done is try to show how this more uh, modern day conception of yin and yang as complements, necessary complements, can help us understand the mind better. Roughly, uh, but it's, it's not actually so rough. It's actually <laughs> fairly accurate to what I think. Uh, yin is receptivity and yang is, uh, yang, and yang is a directed purpose uh, or, or, or um, uh, active purpose. These two things actually cannot be separated. Okay, activity and passivity are total opposites, but receptivity and directed purpose actually always have to go together. If either is present, the other has to be present. Let me give you an example of this uh, in curiosity, okay? Curiosity involves a certain receptivity to what's happening around one, okay? But in order for that receptivity to function, one has to pay attention to what's going on. One has to focus. Focusing is an act of the mind. You want to see what's happening over there or over here. So that is directed purpose, not necessarily self-conscious, but it is part and parcel of what, of, of, of what curiosity involves. I argue in this paper that I, that I send you that every process in a functioning mind has this yin-yang complementarity. But the example I just gave you is sort of like the easiest one to make a fast sense out of, okay? Uh, the ancient, the, 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 this, this um, minority tradition, for example, said that heaven was yang and uh, earth was yin. But it wasn't as if heaven and earth were, co were, were contrary to each other, rather they complement each other. And they exist simultaneously rather than one pushing out the other hostilely, okay? So it's that tradition which I rely on uh, and which I'm you know, illustrating by this example of curiosity. Yeah, very good. I, yeah, and it's an important to note there that um, I take it you're not just um, providing a brand new account. I mean, this is something like this has been, even if a minority of you are there all along. Well, yes and no. Right. Uh, uh, the, the, the minority view has been there all along, but it hasn't been applied to understanding the mind. Right. So I'm using Chinese sources in a way the Chinese didn't think to do. But so much the better for the Chinese tradition. It's better than they realize. And, they, and a, a, a lot of Chinese scholars are now aware of what I'm doing and are rather pleased by it. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask uh, with the sort of uh, <laughs> uh, reception of your, this sort of view is on uh, if there has been much by uh, um, others working in the field or in Chinese philosophy. So, well, it, it, yeah, the, the reception has been in within China, not so much right. in the West. Uh, I think basically the Chinese have to appreciate, uh, better appreciate the resources of their own tradition. Uh, and if they don't accept it, if they don't like it, that the West is not going to pay attention. They don't have to. But if the Chinese take it seriously, then in this increasingly international age, the West will eventually have to take it seriously too. So yeah. I, I've had a very, very nice reception from philosophers in China. Uh, now, with the state of tension now between China and the West, uh, or China and the United States, things have become more difficult. Uh, but over the many years prior to now, I've had a, a whole bunch of scholars, 40 or 50 scholars, work with me on these ideas. And they're back in China, and they're, and, and they're doing their own work, and a lot of it is spreading the word uh, that I've sort of initiated here. Yeah, that's that's great to hear, and it looks like there's there's also a lot more um, that can be explored and stuff uh, as well. Um, I mean, I think that the, the the chief fact 
about this paper and the background to it and the sort of the, uh, the, the, the launching uh, idea is that the West has, to has totally misunderstood the mind philosophically. I'm not talking about neuroscience. I'm not criticizing neuroscience. I'm not criticizing uh, psychology. I'm saying the West philosophically has misunderstood the, the nature of what a mind is in very radical ways. I mean, they, they really have been in total error, according to my view. Uh, and the, the chief error, I think, has been that they've understood the mind as capable of functioning independently of all emotion and all motivation, okay? In other words, uh, our mental functioning, it, it, it can involve emotion, but when we're reasoning or making inferences or simply believing facts about the world, emotion doesn't, and motivation doesn't have to be involved. And uh, I think that's a total mistake, okay? Now the Chinese don't think that. The Chinese don't talk about the mind. And by the way, the Japanese and the Koreans are also along with the Chinese on this. They talk about a heart mind, not about a mind, because they assume that you can't separate the uh, cognitive uh, or rational functions of the mind from all emotion and motivation. They don't assume what the West assumes. They're right about that, according to me. And I, and I, and I you know, and, and today we can explore some of the arguments. They're all in the paper of why I think that the mind is more a heart mind than a mind that allows the isolation of all emotion from anything going on, okay? But the problem with the Chinese has been they haven't, they haven't seen that they have resources to go beyond this. Yes, they don't make the same mistake, in my opinion, that the, the West does. They don't assume that, that, that cognition and emotion can be separate, but they don't go on to, 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 to say what the nature is of the mind itself that doesn't uh, allow for such separation. The ir irony is that it may well be yin and yang, their own notions, okay, that form the basis for understanding how and why, uh, you know, cognition and emotion can't be separated. That's what I've been trying to bring off and, and in this paper tried to do. For sure. So I, we can talk about some of those, um, those arguments you allude to. And one of them I take uh, from er early in the paper is a somewhat quick one for thinking that belief involves an uh, emotional or feeling component. And the idea is something like this, uh, I take it, that belief can come in sort of degrees of epistemic feeling. Feeling is a sort of emotion. And so belief involves emotion. Is that Sort of what you had in mind at that part of the paper. It's sort of. Uh, I think the I think the argument can be can be sharpened a bit from from what you just said. But that's the basic idea. Yes. I mean, I give a, 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 a slightly more formal. A, a, I make a slightly more formal presentation of, of why this is the case. I compare belief with confidence. See, many dictionaries right. define uh, a confidence a strong belief. But we know everyone will admit that confidence is uh, an epistemic or cognitive feeling. Okay, we feel confident. Okay, well, if if, if confidence is, is 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 strong belief, then belief is on the same scale, and it too then involves a, a feeling component. Okay, just slightly doesn't have to be quite as positive uh, as, as confidence. But confidence is strong belief, and then beyond confidence, there's certitude, which is a very very strong feeling. I feel certain, okay? So all of these involve, all of these involve feeling or emotion. This has not been recognized in the West. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, what if someone were to say, and maybe this is sort of the thing, the sort of thing that David Kopp has said, which you mentioned briefly, that feeling here is um, not really feeling in that literal sense of emotion or something like that, but it's maybe a, um, more to do with I don't know how well uh, disposed we are to use these beliefs in practical reasoning and maintain them with respect to others and so on, but that may yeah, not require, you, yeah. You can say that, but then he has to say that we've all been wrong about confidence because everyone grants that confidence is a feeling, okay? It's an epistemic feeling. I feel confident. Uh, so, you know, it's built into uh, our understanding of confidence and certitude that they involve a kind of cognitive or epistemic feeling. Is he going to deny that? Is he going to say, oh, those aren't literally feeling? 
I mean, it makes much more sense to honor the way we think about these things and say, yeah, well, they're not feelings like love. They're not feelings like anger, but they're epistemic feelings. And that's how we generally think of them. But if that's how we think about confidence and certitude, and if belief is on the same scale, then it turns out surprisingly, but I think definitively to involve feeling. Yeah, that's, um, seems about right. I mean, I guess maybe one other concern that I had, it's not directly related to that, but um, it's about some of this theorizing in general, not necessarily yours, but um, theorizing about our mental lives and um, our, our mental lives are sort of immensely complex, right? Um, maybe even much more complex than the relatively simple categories we have for talking about it seem to allow. And, um, um, and the, so maybe the worry is, are, is our theorizing sort of oversimplifying um, uh, the true range of our mental lives at the risk of maybe getting stuff wrong in the end? I mean, um, maybe this is more of a problem for the kind of West, Western atomistic analytic approach, but I mean, what, what do you think about this? Uh, well, I think it, you might be right, you know, but it, you know, but it's a kind of a, a two quoque. I mean, if this, if this applies to what I'm doing, it also applies to what uh, the West has been doing. I just don't know, but I think we've got to make a try. And I think we've got to do better than we've done previously in conceptual terms. Uh, yes, you may be right that, you know, uh, that, that we, um, we aren't fine tuning this enough. But I think the first thing to do is to correct some of the mistakes, some of the faulty assumptions that the West has made and to give us a more complicated uh, or complex picture. I do that in my paper. Now you can then go on and say, yeah, but there are things you're ignoring. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's over simple. But notice one thing, the paper not only talks about how the mind functions, but also how it becomes dysfunctional. So to that extent, it's more complicated than, than, than many accounts tend to be. Uh, and for that reason, you know, I, I think it has a chance to be on the right track. Now, if you can then, hearing and seeing what I've said, say, but look, you, you, you ignore so-and-so. We need a more complex picture. I'll listen. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a fair point. I guess it's the, the criticism, as I say, isn't um, meant to like target out target your your approach or your your uh, claims here um, in particular I guess it's just a more general concern about um, this sort of theorizing in general including the Western kind of analytic yeah well it's a kind of criticism of philosophy as, as yeah. a little a little bit pretentious in offering theories uh, but you know the progress of science is like that too uh, you know, the scientists offer theories, and then it turns out that new data come in, or old data have to be reinterpreted, and the theories have to be discarded in favor of new ideas. I mean, Newton had to be discarded. I mean, Isaac Newton, you know, this, this great thinker, uh, had a great theory that, you know, this theory is, is, is theory of gravitation and all. And then Einstein came along and showed it was too simple. But at least progress was being made. So I, what I guess I want to say is, I think the kind of approach I advocate, which brings in Chinese thought uh, and tries to accommodate Western thought to it and to modify Western thought uh, so that that accommodation can work into a kind of theoretical uh, uh, unity. You know, this, this, needs to be, uh, this needs to be done and then we have to see where we go next. Yeah, fair enough. And you say that beliefs involve a, and like an active practical element as in desiring or valuing. Um, what if uh, we instead held that those features weren't like constitutive of beliefs, but like maybe typically or always occurred alongside them or that beliefs play some role in producing them or something else like that? I mean, I guess more generally, like there's different ways to carve up our mental lives maybe and um, um, we might group certain phenomena under, under a single label, desires, or, or we might just talk about the more basic attitudes and how they're related. I mean, do you understand the, the, the point I'm making? Does that make sense? 
Well, of course it makes it, it makes good sense, but but you know when you try to apply it to um, what I've been saying about belief, or what I would would say and do say about confidence and, and certitude, uh, it, it it doesn't really work for them because you can't just say, oh, certitude is something intellectual, and separate from that, uh, there's a feeling that accompanies certitude. That just doesn't make sense. Certitude, we think of certitude as a feeling, okay? We don't think it causes a feeling, but that it rides alongside a feeling. Certitude is a feeling, okay? So that's the simpler hypothesis, okay? Now, what's not simple, and here I think you, you've got a good point, is the idea that belief in and of itself contains a kind of motivational, kind of, a kind of motivation within it. So why not say, oh, uh, that, yeah, when we have belief, we also have motivation, okay? But that would then need to be explained, okay? You have two alternative views. There's your view, which says that when you have beliefs, you also have certain uh, feelings and motivations, okay? Well, we, we're ruling out feelings because remember, uh, the, there's a strict argument that if confidence involves feelings, so too does belief. But you might say, well, motivations that I talk about, that when you have beliefs, you also have certain motivations to use the belief or the thing believed in certain ways. And you might say, well, you know, why not just say that when you have a, a belief, a certain motivation to use what's believed is, is also there. But remember, when you say that, you have to say, well, why does, it, why does that happen? You need an explanation. It's much easier, though it's somewhat mysterious and awfully surprising to say that the belief itself involves such motivation, okay? But I give an argument for saying that the belief involves the motivation. I haven't given it yet here in, in, in this interview, uh, but I think that um, you've, it, 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 it's a simpler hypothesis and yet in a way it's a much more surprising one, okay? So you've got, you've got to make a choice here and I think you've raised a very good point. You've got to choose between my idea, which is the belief involves a motivation. I haven't given you the argument for that yet, uh, which is surprising. So, you know, the pragmatists wouldn't be so surprised to hear that belief involves certain motivations, right? Uh, but still, it, it, it is somewhat surprising. Uh, and then there's this other view, which you're, you're, you're suggesting might be right, but then it, that raises so many questions. Why is it that when you have beliefs, you also have this motivation? What causes that connection to exist? It's a, if it's a causal relationship, What's the basis of that causal relationship? Believe me, that leaves a lot of unexplained, okay? So what I do is make one grand hypothesis and let me speak to that issue right now, okay? This, if I may, it's gonna take me about three or four minutes, but I guess that's all right, all right. First, let me illustrate for you how yin and yang uh, can help us in a more unified way understand a certain phenomenon, the phenomenon of empathy much better than the way psychologists and most philosophers who talk about uh, empathy, the way they conceive it. What's usually thought is that you have empathy, you feel what the other feels, okay? Uh, and you register their feeling. And then you go on to want to help them. And those are separate phenomena, okay? It's a merely contingent relationship between, between those two. Now, if it's a merely contingent relationship, it's certainly not yin and yang because as I'm conceiving in the young, they are inseparable. They can't be conceived one without the other. So you might say, well, then yin yang doesn't apply to empathy. And I say, no, 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 it does apply because the, the previous psychologists and philosophers have made a certain, have, have failed to see a certain aspect of empathy, which can be brought out as follows. You know, when we empathize, we empathize not only with someone's feeling, but with the internal or intentional object of the feeling. A father who, um, uh, who is empathically infected by his daughter's interest in stamp collecting takes in not just enthusiasm, uh, but enthusiasm directed towards stamp collecting, right? That's full empathy. Now take a case uh, uh, where we talk about the, the desire, the altruistic desire to help. Can that really be separated from the empathy? I say no. So here's my illustration. Let's say someone has uh, uh, empathy with a person who is feeling pain, sh sharp, uh, sharp stabbing pain in their arm, okay? That person is distressed, okay, by the pain in their arm. 
And another person observes this and empathizes with their distress at the pain in their arm. Now notice this. If I am empathizing with their distress at the pain in their arm, I'm empathizing not just with distress, but with distress at that internal or in intentional object. I'm empathizing with distress in that arm. So I'm feeling distress at the pain in their arm. Well, if you're distressed by something, you want, you, you want, to, you know, you want to lessen it or eliminate it. So ipso facto, by the very fact that I've empathized with their distress at the pain in their arm, I have some motivation to get rid of that pain or to help them get rid of that pain, okay? It follows just by sheer analytic reasoning here that I have some motivation. Now, I may not act because somebody may attack me with a knife just as I'm about to help, okay? But the point is there has to be motivation there. Uh, if I'm distressed as they are by the pain in their arm, then I have to want to get rid of that pain somehow to help them get rid of it or do it myself analgesically or as a doctor, something like that. So in fact, you cannot separate an empathic feeling with its intentional object uh, from motivation to help, altruistic motivation to help. So in fact, empathy is a yin-yang phenomenon because as empathizing with their distress at the pain in their arm, that's receptive, right? That's receptivity, okay? As desiring to help them, that's, okay, that's young, purpose, you know, active purpose. So you have uh, yin receptivity uh, and you have yang of active purpose, inseparable in this phenomenon, okay? So it turns out that empathy is a yin yang phenomenon. Very surprising, surprised the hell out of me too, but there it is. And that's partly helped launch me toward Chinese thought as helping to illustrate the nature of the mind. Okay, but now you might say, well, what about belief, okay? But I just wanted to, to, to point out to you First, I mentioned how curiosity involves both yin and yang, but now even empathy involves both yin and yang. So how do you do that with belief? And in particular, what I've been saying and what you were just questioning was, you know, why assume that belief in contains an element of, 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 of purpose or motivation? Or, you know, why not just say it's always accompanied by that? Okay, so again, you'd, you'd need to explain, how, you know, this causal connection, what, what why is there such a causal connection? So, but let me show you or tell you why I think that uh, belief has to involve a motivational element, okay? Uh, and my illustration, uh, well, first of all, it, the simplest point is this. If you believe something, then you automatically have some motivation to use the thing you believe, the proposition that you believe, when you're increasing your understanding of the world. In other words, if you believe P and, and, P, it, and certain things follow from P, or, you know, or P is, is, a, is a datum that together with other data supports an inductive or abductive conclusion, any theoretical, it, once you believe P, you're committed to using P in further theoretical thinking, if you engage in such thinking, okay? So that's already a, an intellectual commitment. Well, an intellectual commitment is a commitment. It's a purpose, it's a motive. You're motivated to use this thing believe when and if you start going on making theoretical further inferences, okay? So that already shows you that belief by itself involves a motivation to make use of what's believed further along if you're going to, you know, if, you, if you're going to make further inferences. Let's say you believe that, uh, that, that there's a palm tree outside. Okay, so, so you believe that rather than believing there are no palm trees, okay? Once you believe there's a palm tree outside, that proposition, you're going to make use of that proposition making further inferences, okay? And you're committed to that. I mean, you, it's part and parcel of what it is to believe. Now, you could say, oh, no, First you believe that there's a palm tree, and then somehow you have a desire to use the proposition there's a palm tree outside to make further inferences. Oh yes, there are palm trees in this area. Or, 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 or oh yes, uh, uh, there, there's life outside uh, this, 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 uh, this house. In other words, you could say that those two, the, the, you know, that just happens that you have this further a tendency, but it seems to me part and parcel of what it is to believe something to have the disposition to use what's believed for further theoretical inferences. 
Okay, so then let me go now to the more practical area, because I think this is really where uh, this kind of yin yang approach. Uh, so notice that in that case, belief has a, both a receptive element you're receiving about the world. There's a palm tree there, I see it, you know, and also a, uh, you know, um, uh, a yang element of I'm going to use it if I make further inferences and try to think more about the world, right? So that, so that already shows a belief has that kind of, but you might say, well, yeah, but what about practical purposes beyond sheer theory? Well, here, there's a real problem in the tradition that I think a yin-yang approach can help us with. And this is all from the paper. Hume said that belief is causally inert, okay? It's purely theoretical, purely cognitive, but it has no uh, desiderative, desiring, motivational element. That's what Hume says, okay? Uh, and Donald Davidson's picture, his wonderful picture in Actions, Reasons, and Causes, his wonderful picture of, you know, of rational, you know, action explanation, makes that assumption implicitly. Davidson never talked about Hume uh, in that paper, but he might have done so because his view is very similar to Hume's. In any event, if you assume that belief is totally inert and inactive, and it, it has, as, as, the, as the literature says, totally uh, a mind to world direction of fit and no world to mind direction of fit. If, if belief is, is, is like that, then you have a real problem of uh, understanding how people uh, can act in instrumental situations. So let me explain what I mean. Let's go back to the 18th century and, and with Hume assume we, don't, we can't order in, we can't, we can't do anything fancy. So a, a person is hungry. And they look in their house and they find that there's no food there. So there's no food in the cupboard. There's no food in the house. Okay. Now, if they're hungry, they're going to go out. Okay. They're going to go out in search of food. Assuming we're in the 18th century here. Okay. Uh, uh, so if they're really hungry, they're going to go out because they know that there's no food in the house. Now, Hume agrees with that kind of thing. He says that, uh, you know, when, when we find things out, we're sent in a new direction, but he has no explanation of why this should happen. Because if belief is as inert and inactive as what he says, then why upon learning that there's no food in your house, doesn't that belief just lie in your mind, inactive? Why does it engage with your desire for food and send you out of the house? There's no explanation if you just say that belief in and of itself, in and of itself is totally inactive and inert. Whereas if you think that belief uh, has a, both a yin and yang element, if you think that belief also involves motivation, then we can explain it. We do it on analogy with what we said, with what I said about uh, the case of theoretical uh, you know, uses of belief. Uh, if you believe there's a palm tree, I'd say, then you're motivated to use that uh, proposition that you believe for further inferences about the world. Okay, similarly, to believe that you have no food in the house, that there's no food in the house, is to be motivated to use what you believe if it can be useful to you in ways that you were motivated uh, uh, to, to, to seek something to help you. So if you believe that there's no food in the house, you're motivated to use that belief if there's any desire which that, can, which that belief can help satisfy. That doesn't tell you yet what the desire is, but it, it, the desire very, much, very nicely offers itself up. Oh, I'm hungry, okay? So that's the desire. And you, to have the belief is to, be, is, is to want to make use of what you believe if any desire comes up to which it can be useful. And by golly, that's just what's happened. So if you have a yin-yang structure to that belief, you can explain not only the, the disposition to make further inferences or to make inferences, but you can also explain why you would want to go out of the house. So that's something which Hume really has no explanation for if, if, if the belief is totally, uh, totally, totally inert. If it totally, as we now say, has a, a mind to world direction of fit, if there's no world to mind, if the world doesn't have to answer to the belief in some way, then there's no explanation. So I said the yin, yang explanation, it, it, it gives us a better picture of how and why when you believe that there's no food in the house and you're in the 18th century and you're hungry, why you're gonna go out of the house. 
Okay, so that's that. That's my, you know, my. Now your your alternative explanation, and it's an interesting possibility, but it is, it 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 really dangles out there, and you know, without you know, without a lot of uh, it, it sort of. It, what you could say is, oh, you have the belief, and whenever you have a belief, you also have a desire to use what you believe in in in, in to help you with your practical uh, motives. Okay, but I say it's just simpler to assume that, the, you know, it, would it would it really be, you know, you you what you're saying is, oh, you also have this desire, but could someone believe that something was the case without having a desire to use it for inferences? No. Well, why not say the same here? That, in other words, that it's built into belief that if we believe something, we're pre we're prepared and we would desire to use it in inferences. But also when we believe something, we desire to use the thing believed to help our practical activities. So, you know, why not just say the same thing about both? Okay, so that's that's my reason why. I, I think the idea that there just happens also always to be another uh, 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 another thing going on there strikes me as a little odd. Could there really be a belief? You believe P uh, and it's, and it really is the belief that it is, but it so happened that in this one case, the desire uh, to make further inferences with it wasn't there. No, I say it's part and parcel of what it is to be a belief that you should want to make use uh, of it in further inferences if you make such further inferences. So that's my answer to what you were saying. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of uh, very excellent points there. It's like part of the idea is, because um, on Hume, as you talk about this, he's got this sort of atomistic view that these different attitudes are in some sense isolated. Not, there's no necessary right. connections between right. them. And also maybe like beliefs and uh, are causally inert. And desires. And beliefs and desires are separate for you. Yeah. And, um, and, and so part of your criticism there is, um, well, one, you have reason to think that they're not really separate, but further um, and on that, I guess, uh, when in, in causally explaining why we take a particular action, um, for example, um, if the belief plays no causal role, then um, right. it seems to me that we should be saying, or should be allowed to say that um, whatever was there absent the belief, it can causally explain that action just as well as if the belief were also there. Maybe that's part of the idea. Um, adding in the belief if it's causally inert, it should make no difference to the causal consequence. That's another way of putting it. That's another yeah. way. That's even, I think it's a little too harsh with you, but you could put it that way. You could put it that way. It's nice. Yeah. And then, then someone might respond and say, well, okay, um, but the, and then maybe this is how you're characterizing the view I'm uh, presenting, uh, which is that whenever there is this causally inert belief, there is this other state which isn't causally inert, um, but then we need some further explanation for why that coincides in some way. Um, whereas you're unifying them under one state, kind of in a, as a. And I'm thing. analogizing with the case of theoretical thinking because I think it's easier for us to see if you really believe a, a given proposition, you know, you're going to have to want to make use of it in any theoretical inferences you make thereafter, right? Uh, and if you don't, then you really didn't believe the thing in the first place. I mean, somebody yeah. who is unwilling to, 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 to make any deductions from a given P uh, or to make use of P uh, for any theoretical purposes can't be said really to have believed P. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like uh, the person who says, I, I believe P, but then when they're you know constructing their view of the world, don't incorporate their belief that P um, right. and, and which does that make any P? sense? I'm saying that doesn't make any sense. Or the, or the person we would, who says- We would then deny that they really had the belief. Right, or, or, or in the empathy case, the person who says they were empathetic uh, with some person or, or some experience that they're having, that they really, what, weren't motivated at all to do something about it. Well, if they weren't motivated, then what we would say is they really don't have the empathy. Right. That's the way to put it. They don't really exactly. have empathy. And, 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 you know, I mean, there are people who lack empathy, 
and, and, and who are not altruistic. And a great, great class of them are known as psychopaths. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can talk, you could say the same about the other cases you mentioned, like thirst and curiosity. And... There, yeah, there, there is a, um, a, a famous, in China anyway, Chinese philosopher from the 16th century uh, named Wang Yangming. And this is the style of argument he initiated and inaugurated. You, you know, uh, we make a tight connection between A and B. And, and, uh, and the proof of it is, uh, as soon as we deny B, we see reason to deny A too. And that's the kind of, so if the person isn't motivated to help the person, then they really didn't have empathy for, for their suffering and their pain. This reversing, you know, um, you know, um, Is, is typical of his kind of argumentation. And it's what I use, and you were using it just now yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It, it seems uh, to have a lot going for it. Um, another thing you now, talked about- let me, just, let me just add that I think what I'm telling you today is probably more different from anything else in your series <laughs> than anything else in your series is from any other other thing in your series. It's really, re, I'm really saying that the Western perspective on the mind is totally inadequate and, it's, and, and we need a major course correction here. So this is a very extreme view, but I, but I, I think that there are a lot of persuasive reasons uh, to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, to date, I think, because I, I, I interviewed um, Jenny Hung, I don't know if, if you're familiar with her, and she's done some work on considering um, or importing sort of uh, Buddhist and Chinese philosophy into a analytic tradition, but it's not not the sort of, um, it's not with the goal of, or conclusion of saying, no, nah, no, the certain Western notion or conclusions are really wrong or limited in certain ways. It's just a, um, uh, you know, giving an analytic take on, on some of these notions. But I, I really, yeah. yeah. Um, that people have done. Yeah, I, maybe not enough. I think we need more, some, maybe some no, more of this interdisciplinary work. We yeah. absolutely do need more of that, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and the fact that I rely on yin and yang is, would be such a turnoff for any philosophy professor in the West. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't try to, try to persuade Western scholars. I think the point is really to try to persuade the Chinese to be a little less deferential to the West and take a little more seriously the resources of their own tradition. Yeah. You know, no Chinese, no Chinese person, no Chinese author that I've ever heard of has ever said that the West is mistaken to separate the intellectual or cognitive from the emotional and motivational. They've never said it. Their, their own concepts involve a, 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 you know, a, a connection there rather than a disconnection, but they never say that the West is wrong. The typical move, and this is, it's sort of too bad. The typical move is, oh, the West must have a different notion. You know, we are right about our notion, they're right about this. But I think that's too deferential. I think the fact is, and he, as a Western philosopher who speaks, uh, native English, uh, maybe I can make the point more easily than the Chinese scholar. God, Chinese scholar, if they were to say, oh, you're wrong about your own notions, okay, they would say, yeah, well, you don't know the, tr the correct translations, you, you, you know, so you're not a native speaker. It's easier for a native speaker to say, look, uh, it's not that the West has different concepts from China and that the West is right about its concepts and China is right about its. No, the West has mistheorized its own concepts. And I can say that as someone who speaks English um, pretty well. Right. Yeah. So the Chinese can't, can't do it, you know, so easily because they would be questioned on, on their knowledge of English. <laughs> it, takes a, it takes a Westerner to criticize a Westerner. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, um, so another distinction you introduce in the paper in response to a potential objection um, is the difference between uh, yin favoring and, and, and yang favoring. And so 
as I understand it, yin vaping is, is somewhat like um, this. It's belief. Like, receptive notion of belief or maybe just belief yeah yeah, yeah. Right. Right. um and 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 young is more like a is a like practical the active purpose. practical favoring yeah and you you employ this distinction in response to the objection that um for example it doesn't make sense to um to favor something uh that you prefer not to be so um, right like the the husband so I say that the, when the husband believes his wife has been unfaithful, uh, I, I say that he favors uh, that hypothesis or that, that, that claim. And somebody will immediately say, he doesn't, he's not in favor of his wife being unfaithful, not at all, not at all. Uh, he's very unhappy about it. So how can you say that belief involves favoring? So then I try to distinguish two kinds of favor. Right. And I give these four different examples uh, to illustrate it. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into it here, but you know, I, I, I do try to illustrate how there can be different kinds of favoring. Right. I mean, the 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 main point is that um, in that case where um, uh, we might say that he favors it, um, but doesn't prefer it. What's going on there is that he uh, yin favors it. But doesn't Yang favor it or Yang? Yeah, so the it? word prefer applies in that case more easily to the Yang side. Yes, good point. That's a nice point. Yeah, and and so. Um, but look, like, I could I could respond here and say, look, but if you really push it, you can say that he uh, that he prefers the hypothesis that his wife is unfaithful to the hypothesis that his wife is faithful. In that sense, there are two kinds of preference too. Mm, yeah. Right. Okay. You could push it. It just, it, but you were right that the with prefer it's it, it it's 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 harder to make that distinction. Right. But he does epistemically prefer the hypothesis that his wife is unfaithful to the hypothesis that she's uh, that she that she's faithful. One of the one of the nice things about yin and yang is that it not only gives us a way of of of, of describing the metaphysical. Uh, the necessary constitution of any functioning mind, but it also tells us tells us something about values, okay, uh, and that's and this is something I ar argued for in my book, uh, the philosophy of Yin and Yang, which was published by the Commercial Press uh, in China in Beijing in 2018, uh, and it, it's published with side by side English language and Chinese language um, uh, texts, um, and I. I deliberately wanted to have the thing published uh, with, the, with both languages in China rather than publishing just in English in America because China is part of my, my main audience. Now in that book and, and here today, I, I, I want to emphasize, uh, I have wanted to emphasize that yin and yang not only help us metaphysically uh, or uh, conceptually understand the mind, but they also help us understand our values. Because you see, Yin receptivity is something we value. We believe a person, you know, an open-minded person, for example, or a curious, inquisitive person. These are forms of receptivity. So receptivity is something we value. And directed purpose is too. If somebody has no purpose in life, um, if they waffle and wobble and uh, are fickle and, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, go from one thing to another, changing them, we, we don't think well of that either. So directed purpose and receptivity are qualities we value. And if I'm right that they go necessarily together, then they constitute a unity of values, which itself is a further value, namely, uh, the, you know, the unity in complexity here. Uh, it's a kind of unity. I mean, there are two different sides to the unity, but they can't be separated. So it's a kind of unity. A unity of valuable things is further valued because it is a unity of valued things. We value unity, as in science we do or in philosophy. So. This allows the yin-yang analysis not only to tell us about the metaphysical constitution or the constitution of, of, of minds, but also to explain some of our values here. For example, I talked about the psychopath who, you know, well, the whole point about a psychopath is they lack yin and yang with respect to the suffering of others. They aren't receptive, okay? They may know that the other person is suffering, but they don't, but they don't have that intimate knowledge that you get through empathy. I mean, everyone now knows empathy is a way of very intimately knowing. It's like almost like perception, so emotional perception. So the psychopath lacks 
both the in receptivity of empathy, but also lacks the motivation, directed purpose. It leaves them cold, as we might say, when they see someone suffering or makes them want to hurt them, uh, which is, a, 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 that's another story that, that I don't want to go into right now. So in any event, uh, we can say that the distinction between an altruistic person who is empathic and compassionate and who wants to help and the psychopath is a yin-yang distinction. One has the yin-yang, the other lacks it. This is, so I want to say that in many, many, many cases, cases that I'm aware of, and some of which I describe in the paper, uh, yin and yang make the difference as to value. Yeah. Moral, moral value and also uh, prudential value. Right, right. I should, I should have mentioned that book in the introduction as well. The, the, um, but, and this is sort of related as well to what you say toward the end of the article about how like irrationality and deplorable states and processes um, can come about as uh, the result of an absence or a limitation of, of yin and yang. And um, no, it, let me just correct that. It's not that they come about as a result of, because that's a causal thing. Rather, yeah. they're constituted by a lack of yin and yang. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's a good um, uh, point to make. Um, I was just going to say, I, I think I can, I can definitely see how this works in some cases, including the ones you mentioned. Um, but I mean, what about cases where a person just really has some like deplorable desires and brings about that which they desire? And I mean, I mean in what sense does this involve a lack of um, uh, or uh, yin and uh, yang? Like maybe we could apply this to the sadism and masochism case you talked about. Well, we could also apply it to the psychopath. Yeah. Okay. In, in, okay. But you're actually, you know, I said before that there were some complications that I, I didn't want to go into, but you're making me go into them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, but, and I don't go into them in the paper. Um, there's a whole realm of, of, of what you could call, um, you know, uh, negative situations and neg neg negative facts that, that we need this kind of analysis uh, uh, to be able to deal with if it's to be really valid, okay? But here, I, I, I want to say, look, this is new thinking. And if it works for many cases, then there's some reason to try to apply it to other cases, okay? And, um, but then, but what, what normal science, the idea of normal science is you don't have an answer to every question that comes up within the theory. You have to do the work to find the answers. And I say that I have to do a lot of work here. Now, in the case of you say, somebody who has bad desires, who wants to hurt people or whatever, Okay, uh, uh, I, th I think you have to be very particular about cases. It could be that there could be different ways in which someone can have bad desires. And depending on which way they do, uh, just as in the paper, I talk about different forms of irrationality. There can be different forms of bad desire. Now, what, so let's talk about a psychopath for a moment. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, a serial, a serial, a serial rapist. Um, somebody who was, as a child, raped, let's say, daily by his uncle, and then becomes a rapist of little boys later on in life. I mean, we have to be very specific if we want to talk about evil, okay? I'm saying every case has to be done on its own, but this is one kind of case that we're familiar with. So here's one thing. I mean, I think this needs more work. But first of all, uh, we, we must say that this person is devoid of typical empathic um, uh, empathy with their victims. On the contrary, uh, they, they don't take any account of what the little boy may want to do in his life. He may want to have ice cream. He may want to stay with his mother or be with his mother. They have no regard, okay? And, 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 and therefore, any purpose that could come out of that is absent. But you might say, well, but they have their, their horrible purpose, uh, you know, and, and, it, it's, uh, uh, and it, it's, it's a... Um, directed act of purpose. They seem to have directed act of purpose. I say that we really should consider the fact that this person was hurt by the uncle, but is hurting someone totally different. And somebody who doesn't resemble the uncle even. It's not as if he takes it out on other people's uncles. He takes it out on a little boys, okay? So here, in a way, the purpose of this person 
is really split. It's not directed and unified the way most purposes are. I mean, if, 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 if I go to the store because I want ice cream, uh, the going to the store is one thing and, and the eating of the ice cream is another, but the going to the store is subsumed, right? Under the desire for ice cream, right? It's part of the same purpose. But with the, uh, with the serial rapist, I think the best psychological explanation has them as a kind of split personality. I mean, the, the normal thing, if I may say, to want is revenge on that uncle, okay? Or for your mother for allowing this to happen, you know? Or your father or whatever. Uh, but they don't, that's not what their purpose is. So there's a kind of split in their personality uh, between what, you know, what, what's making them angry and what they're doing about it. So there's, you know, so I say this kind of split in personality is not, is, is, is not young in the way that going to the store would be young to get the ice cream. Uh, and so I think that needs to be explored further, but that's my first, uh, my first take or my first pass at, at how, how, how this kind of theorizing would work. Yeah, yeah, that's, in that's an interesting, for sure. That's an interesting point. I mean, obviously there's gonna be more cases that can be more complicated. And yeah. so you might have to um, theorize a bit more, but. Um, you yeah, say I mean, that's, normal science yeah. is not supposed to be easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't we don't suppose that the um, all of the possible cases are going to be captured in the initial theory. You say that's right, or or immediately uh, captured. Yes, right. Obviously, That'd be obvious. Yeah. Obviously, treatable. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and but, but I mean, the conclusion I reach is that that the, of necessity, the mind, our mind any conceivable mind has to be basically a yin yang emotional thing. And either the yin yang of the emotions are distorted and we get irrationality and immorality, or uh, they are not distorted. And what we get is yin and yang going uh, everywhere where the mind is being functional. That's my kind of conclusion. Right, right. For sure, and and something else you mentioned um, uh, later on in the paper is that you you end up suggesting that beliefs and desires are some, in some sense the same sort of mental phenomenon. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, but, yeah, yeah. Because if beliefs if beliefs uh, involve motivation to do something, motivation means desire. I mean, that's just a, a fancier word for it. So you need to then argue, uh, or I do in fact argue. That desires also involve some kind of uh, some kind of uh, yin receptivity. That's the basis for the desire. Uh, I mean, the, the simplest case is is the, the discomfort of, of a parched throat. Okay, is presupposed in thirst, and thirst may be a desire to drink, but it's based on a discomfort of a parched throat, of a dry a sense of dryness. So, again, you can't have the desire without some kind of a uh, yin receptive basis for it. Uh, and that would be uh, one possible example. So in that case, you would say, well, so both desires and beliefs have a yin and yang side to each and every one of them. So, you know, what do you say at that point? Uh, and so what I, what I say in the paper is, well, you can say that my view uh, entails that they're basically the same kind of thing, namely yin yang things. But this doesn't mean that the concept of desire is the same as the concept of belief. And what I say is when we talk about desire, we're focusing on the yin end of something. And when, when we sorry, when we talk about belief, we're, we're focusing on the yin end of something. And when we talk about desire, we're focusing on the yang end of the, of the same kind of thing, okay? So the concepts are different. And that, and that could even explain why we don't see uh, the full picture that I'm trying to present. We're sort of we're sort of carried away by the concepts we have to think that that's the whole story. I don't say this in the paper. You've inspired me or, or <laughs> disinspired me to say it here. Yeah, that you know we, we we focus so much on the one end that it makes us forget or not even acknowledge or ever, ever realize that there's another end. That when we focus and talk about belief, you know we're so focused on the the in end that the 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 young end of it is is never in our awareness right right so the point is that we're emphasizing or perhaps only aware of certain features of that 
uh, state or process when we talk but about deep down food. they are basically the same kind of thing and they're yin yang emotional things because they all involve some kind of emotion right yeah now you might say well why does desire have to involve emotion but i think a little thinking a little thought can can answer that question for you uh you know if you really desire something and you don't get it you're going to be disappointed and if you do get it you're going to be pleased those are emotions so desire involves emotion in the sense of emotional dispositions mm, right yeah and if you didn't have those emotional dispositions we might not even attribute to you the desire in the first place absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah i had a somewhat um uh uh off topic question well i was still related to yin and yang and i think you say is uh in passing in the paper somewhere that um, that it, the notion you have might be applicable to things apart from the mind, like oh, else, oh did, yes, did, yeah. I mean, you did you have anything in mind that? there? I mean, I, I oh, I have a lot in mind. I just <laughs> published an article in the East West Journal called Tao, in which I talk about the way that Yin Yang uh, pervades not the mind, though you could say that too. It pervades the, the natural physical world. Okay. Uh, so I'll give you one example. I mean, you, you need a lot of examples and you need you know, to case by case by case. But here's an example where very surprisingly, or, well, I'll give you two examples. I'll start with one. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, yeah, okay. Let's, let's let, you know, Newton's third law says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That can be conceptualized in yin yang terms. I mean, let's say I'm holding a rubber ball and I'm squeezing it in, okay, so that it, right? So the rubber ball is receptive to the pressure of my fingers, but it pushes back against it. So, it's, so it is both yin receptive and yang directed, okay? Uh, so we have to understand yang not here as purpose, uh, but as impulse or impulsion. Uh, so actually, the, the, when I try to talk about both mind and the physical world, the, wor the word I use for young is impulsion. Okay, so our purpose is a kind of mental impulsion, but in the physical world, there's a kind of impulsion on the part of the rubber ball to push back against the fingers. Okay, uh, and that's an impulsion too, and that's young too. So in in, in that case, um, uh, we um, uh, we have yin and yang. Uh, illustrating Newton's third law. I think you could also show how the, the Newton's first and, and, and second laws also uh, can, can, uh, can be conceptualized in yin-yang terms. It's very surprising. And you can also find this in chemistry, uh, the process of rusting. It involves uh, oxygen invading iron, basically, you know, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and so the iron takes, takes in the oxygen uh, and, 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 and so in that process, there, there is something being invaded, namely the iron, by oxygen. Oxygen is, is yang, and the iron is yin, receptive, and it rusts, and that's the result of its, or, or the fact of its being receptive to, to the oxygen uh, that, that comes in. So in general, uh, you can apply yin and yang, I, I, and I argued this in the paper that appeared in, in Tao. Uh, I argued this in... Um, in, in, in the paper in Tao, that in general, every area of science allows of a yin-yang interpretation. Um, and then I go on from there in, 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 to, to say, what can we, how can we generalize from that? Um, I don't think I need to go into that here, but I think it's interesting that you can use yin and yang in, in physical cases. Yeah, that is interesting. I, it, I mean, it might seem to admit to a wide range of different cases now that I'm thinking about it, um, like those that you mentioned. So yeah, yeah look, I mean, don't, don't tempt me. <laughs> I'll start <laughs> talking about a wider range of cases. I think for, for this discussion, I've said enough yeah. uh, in the different area. I do say in the paper that if anyone wants to get in touch with me and find out more about how yin and yang pervade the physical, uh, the, or at least the orderly physical realm, uh, they can contact me at mslote at miami.edu. 
for sure. I'll, I'll send the material, relevant material. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> lucky thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and moving back to the um, the mental uh, case, <laughs> um, you also talk about how um, about depression and how that is a um, involves a um, lack of receptivity to like outside information, but also uh, a lack of directed purposeness to maybe do something about their state and so forth. Um, I mean, how might, uh, it seems like a, a reasonable way to think about it, but I mean, is there, is there something in this that um, might help people to, to think about and maybe get out of um, that oh, depressed state? Oh, is there any practical use? Yeah. Oh. There might be, but I haven't really thought a lot about about that. I, I guess maybe the more the more basic question is how can we, what can we do to sort of like cultivate yin and yang in our in our oh okay lives? yes look yeah. this raises an issue that uh, we haven't really it, it only came up at one point where you you said something causal and I said no it's not a question of causality it's a question of constitution of the thing uh, so. Uh, So when I talk about yin and yang, I'm talking constitutively rather than causally, okay? Uh, it's, for example, let's take the case of empathy. This kind of illustrates it nicely. Someone might interpret what I've been saying in terms of yin and yang to say, well, the yin causes the yang. That when you, when you uh, are feeling uh, the person's, uh, uh, what, uh, their distress at the pain in their arm, when you're feeling that, that causes you to want to help them. But that's not what I say. I say that insofar as you are feeling their distress, as if you were they, you already are motivated to get rid of it. Okay, that's constitutive. So in general, there are psychological questions which this theory doesn't answer. Like under what circumstances is one likely to have full empathy with someone? Or, you know, uh, I mean, let's say I'm angry with the person, okay? I'm less likely to have empathy with them. Everyone knows that from the literature. Even if they're in pain, we don't object so much to the sufferings of people we hate. You know, we don't feel empathy for the people we hate. You know, so there, there is a causal question, namely, under what conditions do we get this yin yang phenomenon of empathic altruism? Okay, but that's not the question I'm asking. So, but by the same token, it is an advantage of what I'm saying that it isn't hostage to scientific investigations. Because it says, in effect, that investigations can say under, under what circumstances this kind of thing happens. All I'm saying is when it happens, it constitutively involves yin and yang. Okay, so that's that's it's a matter of constitution rather than a matter of of of, 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 of competing with science as to a theory of causal origins. Right. Yeah. That's that's a good point, and. Um... And that holds everywhere that I'm talking, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to compete with science. On the contrary, the problem with the ancient theories of yin and yang was they were competing with what we now know as the truth in modern science. But I'm perfectly willing and able to accept anything that science tells me because I'm just giving a conceptual stru structure for whatever science turns out, uh, turns up as the truth. Yeah, but, uh, but more on like how to, um... Like if I oh, wanted to be the, the the depression kind of thing. Yeah, but on on uh, well, not necessarily with depression, but just like on on cultivating more of a yin and yang attitude. Like, um, uh, I mean, maybe this is more just like a. Um, well, no, no, you're raising thing. a question that's very very prominent. In fact, it's absolutely central to Chinese thought, namely that uh, the idea of moral self cultivation. Okay. Um, and they think that that's essential and really pervasive of, of, of a good life. But you know, moral self-cultivation is a pretty rare phenomenon. I don't know if the Chinese go in for it, but in the West here, how many people do you know of who are deliberately trying to make themselves into better people? It's not how people work. Now, you might be saying that, um, that there are times when you have done something really bad and you realize how bad it was, you feel guilty about it. Uh, and 
it may it impels you to, to turn over a new leaf. Um, you know, uh, the example I've used in, in in other work is the example of somebody who's engaged to a Korean American young woman, and he visits her parents, and he's sort of put off by the strangeness of their customs, and he later finds out that he's hurt their feelings because they saw how put off he was, and. He, he wants to be a better person and to be more open to the values of this other culture. So he starts reading more in, in Korean literature and, 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 and uh, Korean history, okay? So this is a way of cultivating a, a betterness. Uh, and I, I think that can happen independently of talking about yin and yang. You can put it in terms of yin and yang. You can say, look, you know, you're not being, you're like a, you're like a psychopath who doesn't have empathy uh, for, for, for somebody in pain. You don't have empathy for your potential in-laws. So you can analogize that way. And the yin-yang can be helpful, but it, you don't have to bring in yin-yang to make these points. Yeah. He's just being insensitive. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, he, and, and, he, and, and, he, and he's, he's pulled up short and he feels guilty and ashamed. And he, it makes him want to do something about it, namely to read some more Korean history. Yeah, I was, I was also wondering, um, and I guess we've talked a, a bit about some of the um, um, some of the areas, but where do you think there um, is room for like future research and, and development of some of these concepts and uh, ideas? I mean, is well, I think you I think you've pinpointed a lot of what's needed so. or phenomena and making sure, uh, you know, that it doesn't oversimplify and possibly bringing in further elements. Here's something that I haven't done, God help me. Uh, are there degrees of yin and yang? Mm. Oh, you know, that, uh, but, he, my, my, but my answer to you here and now is very much in keeping with what I said to you earlier. If phenomena occur, which force one in all plausibility to bring in degrees of the thing, then you damn well better do it. So far, I haven't seen the need but I might very well, very soon see that need. Yes. So, yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think we have to explore more phenomena. And, you know, there's also yin and yang having to do with societies. See, uh, you know, uh, in my work as a moral sentimentalist, I've tried to analogize between sympathy and empathy at the individual level and what is reflected in the legislation or governmental actions uh, of a whole society. Okay, uh, is there such a thing as a caring government, or a caring society kind of thing? Now, I think that if you're going to push the yin yang thing and you think yin yang is part of caring, for example, in the empathy case and others, you'd damn well be able, better be able to talk about how yin and yang uh, 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 can come in at the, at the social or political level. I've done some work on that, by the way. I think it's worth doing, absolutely. Yeah, on, on, on that first issue, um, whether it could come in degrees, you mentioned, um, like intuitively, maybe just maybe this is wrong, but um, I mean, you can be more or less receptive, you can be more or less um, um, purposive and so forth. Uh, I mean, doesn't that suggest that they, they can come in degrees or? It suggests it, uh, but you can, but, but it also, but you see, we also have. Uh, there, there is a talking about degrees, but there, we also talk about the absolutes and when the degree, when quantity passes over into quality, as, as Hegel might have put it, uh, or did put it. Uh, so you see, we have degrees of belief, but at some point we say, oh, he does believe. And at earlier points, we say he doesn't believe. So although there is a, a grid of degrees, we still make the, the simple judgments about belief or not belief. And there could be still, yes, there are degrees of receptivity, but at a certain point, we say, this is a receptive person. You know, one doesn't have to be the most receptive person in the world, uh, the most feelingful person in the world to count as an empathic person or to count as, uh, you know, or as a receptive person. So that's how so far I've managed to work it, namely by intuitive judgments about what counts as being receptive in that absolute simple sense, rather than to, to forcing you to talk about always degrees. Yeah. Um, Does that work out? I don't know. But it, that's, that's one way to proceed right because you might think that that it's also when we talk about like degrees of confidence um when 
and maybe at some confidence we just say, ah, oh, the person just believes it. Um, right. Uh, or right. the person is confident at a certain point, yeah. right? You don't oh, have yeah. to be certain in order to be confident. So we know that there's something less than certitude can be sufficient for confidence. But at what point? You know, we, you know, but we have, we, you know, if we're educated and we speak the language well, we'll have intuitions about that. And I'm inclined to rely on those intuitions uh, until I'm forced not to. Yeah, and, and it seems to me that um, if we go this way or if uh, with, the, with yin and yang, I mean, that's an available option that someone can be um, on a scale of receptivity. Yes. And at some point we just say they're receptive, you know. Yeah, and right. right. And, and so I, I, you know, I haven't worked that out, no, but right. that's a possible way to go. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap up in a few minutes, but um, as a couple more general questions. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want to go outside my narrow little topic here, <laughs> not so, it's not so narrow, but if you want to go outside the topic, feel free. I'm here, you know. <laughs> uh, sounds good. I mean, uh, what do you think some of the, um, aside from, I mean, I guess this is, the, what we've been focusing on here, but do you think there's a lot uh, that uh, Western sort of analytic philosophy has to learn from um, more Eastern traditions? Um, are we really missing out a lot by by not by not? Uh, well, I mean, exploring? I think in this area that I've I've uh, that I've uh, taken uh, as my interest. Yeah, I mean that's that's all. But you you're, you're asking are there other issues? Well, let, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, there are certain questions that the West has asked that the Chinese never thought to ask, and they don't seem to have the resources within their tradition to ask. For example, free will, okay, or skepticism. There's no, there's, there's not much of a history of, of, of epistemological skepticism in China. Uh, uh, the, the problem of universals, you know, are there such things as numbers? They never, they never really asked those questions. There was a school of names in ancient China, but they never got that far. Uh, and it and it lapsed after uh, after a short while. So there are all kinds of questions that we in the West have have have, have boldly gone into, and it's to our credit that we have. The Chinese have have just not done it. But in ethics and in the understanding of the mind, they do have a, a long tradition, and I think we can make use of their long tradition. But you're you're asking other. But look in general about Western philosophy. Uh, there's a reluctance to talk about the philosophy of life, you know, in the way that the continental philosophers like Heidegger and Sartre and Nietzsche uh, do. And I think the West would do well to think about philo the philosophies of human existence generally in life, but to do it in an analytically more careful way than these, I mean, Heidegger makes mistakes and is, you know, and it just jumps all over the place. Uh, uh, but you know, to do it better, to do it better. Uh, but to, to, but those topics, uh, it's as if those topics have been banned because they were done so poorly by these others. But I think, in fact, that you do find some insights, some a lot of nonsense, but a lot of insights too in Heidegger, let's say. Uh, so uh, so I think that's something that the West really. Now you say, well, is that China? Does China have that kind of thing? Well, China does have more, I mean, Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu, you know, Taoism, uh, uh, does have ideas about the philosophy of life. But to be honest, I'm not terribly um, impressed with the kind of philosophy of life you get out of, uh, out of Taoism, okay? Uh, so, so I'm not sure that I want to criticize the West more than I already just have. Yeah. Yeah, but the West, uh, has, the West has made a great contribution, greatest, maybe the greatest contribution to philosophy comes from the West. But we need to bring in the Chinese tradition, maybe also the Indian tradition, if we really want to go into our internationalized future and take make it take advantage of all the resources that philosophy's history has made available if we're willing to make use of them. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a good point. And, and it makes me wonder like when we have um, certain notions and areas of philosophy that that don't even come up or um, that other cultures don't even have the resources to talk about, maybe like you mentioned, like free will or um, 
skepticism. Universals. Universals. Um, almost makes me worry that these are, um, how, how serious of a problem are, how serious of problems are these? I mean, um, well, I'm not, I'm not inclined to be as skeptical as you're seeming yeah. to be at this point. You see, the first point that I think that needs to be made, and it's not, I think, fully appreciated, is there are only three places on this planet where philosophy has endogenously originated, India, China, and Greece. Okay, those are the only places. The ancient Israel had no such thing as philosophy. In the New World, those three literate civilizations, they didn't have such a thing as philosophy. Babylonia, Egypt, no philosophy there. So, so you know, just because, I mean, I'm inclined to say these are important problems and it, it, only certain cultures have appreciated those problems. You know, it's a little bit like intelligent college students. Some of them go for philosophy. Some of them are so put off by philosophy that they don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, well, well, I say, look, uh, it, the fact that some people are put off by philosophy doesn't in any way diminish my sense that these philosophical questions are important. Are, are important. So I'm not, you know, uh, you know, it's that, that that free will was not asked by the Chinese. I still think it's important. Right. So the point being that even if a lot of people or cultures um, didn't consider or appreciate these questions or problems, you, it doesn't mean they're not genuine. Yeah. And you might say, look, uh, you know, ancient Israel and Babylonia didn't appreciate philosophy at all. And China only partially appreciated philosophy. You might say that. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's the problems discussed in philosophy aren't genuine or worth considering. That doesn't mean they aren't important. Right. Um, and sort of, I guess on a related um, metaphilosophical note, um, as something I ask a lot of the um, guests that come on here, what do you think some of the um, significant value of philosophy is in general? And maybe more specifically in some of the stuff that you work on, like in ethics and uh, and uh, mind. So what you, what you, I, what you, what you may be uh, hinting at or moving toward is is the question is um, is ethics uh, if when you do ethics can that be helpful to the ethical behavior of individuals? Okay. If you're asking, I mean, or are you asking something else? But if that's the question you're asking, I mean, I think some of the best people in the field of ethics are real SOBs. <laughs> it hasn't helped them to be very nice, but they can have great philosophical insights. Uh, but you might say, well, all right, all right, all right. But could someone make use of, 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 of philosophical approaches to ethics and, a, you know, a good hearted uh, person who wants to educate, can they help with ordinary uh, lives, uh, I think they could. Uh, you know, I once tried to write a little, uh, a little popularized book about ethics, and and, and <laughs> my publisher said that I had no talent for that sort of thing, <laughs> so it didn't work at all. Uh, and it was sort of embarrassing. So, but I, I do think uh, that's that. Yeah, I mean, I think, for example, I mean, I'm a sentimentalist, and I so and and now I'm really flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, I'm a sentimentalist, and I think empathy is very important. Kantian rationalists don't think empathy is all that important to the moral life. I think empathy is very important to the moral life, and I don't think it necessarily gets you into some kind of human relativity and, and skepticism, the way many Kantians would say. I think that's wrong. My book, the, uh, the, uh, it's called Moral Sentimentalism, attempts to show that sentimentalism needn't make everything relative to human nature or make it all emotional uh, in, in a bad way. Uh, so, you know, I, I, so I do think that, uh, uh, that, that, that you can, and, and it, if you emphasize empathy, uh, I think you can speak to ordinary people. You see, we're living in what Franz Deval calls the age of empathy. That notion of empathy was never breeded about, never bandied about 40 years ago. You're too young to know that. But in fact, 40 years ago, nobody talked about empathy. It was only in the last 40 years. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, I feel your pain kind of stuff. All of that is an impetus toward, and now we think that if a person lacks empathy, that's a major criticism. Well, I think, uh, you know, that a philosopher who puts empathy front and center in, in theoretical work can speak 
to this popular culture and this popular notion of the importance of empathy and bring the two together in some way. But I guess I'm not the person to do it. <laughs> I'm just not the talented one in that area. Right, but I mean, different people, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I mean, we have somebody different can talents and I someone, somebody someone can do that. Yeah. Somebody um, should. Yeah, so in I mean, other words, the, In other words, just to point yeah. out, that, that not only are we all talking about empathy here and there and everywhere in our modern culture, but that there's theoretical backing for it. Yes. Right. And the philosophy can help us explore that and, and maybe help apply it. And so it actually is more it. useful than a lot of these people might think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, I think, I think with that, I'm going to draw the, uh, questions to a close um i'll say that it's been excellent having you here thanks for thanks for joining and, and taking my questions and uh providing your thoughtful responses it's been, it's been excellent <laughs>